Thank you, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> this part of the show you'll enjoy, but quite often not show really. It's a conference at the beginning of a censorship industrial complex. Carried away, of course. Uh, we're going to uh, take some questions from the audience. If you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. Although we have been chatting to the uh, star of everyone in the world's favourite movie, The Shawshank Redemption, Mr. Tim Robbins, with a question. Round of applause for the great Tim Robbins. I suppose that, in particular, my uh, worldview is undergirded by spiritual principles, and I don't mean that in a deracinated, woo-woo way. I mean that kindness, service, a willingness to forgive and be forgiven seem to me to be an absolute necessity if we're going to progress. It's more than that, though. It's more that it's morally correct to be forgiving and loving to other people. It's that it is a necessity of the necessary victory for in order that we do not yield to centralised authoritarianism. Because uh, for me, it seems like that's where this is going. It seems that it's almost like you could see the shapes forming of, oh, wait a minute, the American government are using taxpayer dollars to acquire private data of its citizens from private companies in order to bypass its own legislation. The military-industrial complex appears to require forever wars in order to underwrite its economic model. We're going to find ourselves literally somewhere between the twin dystopias of those great literary prophets, Orwell and Huxley, and already the, the name has been evoked, of course, of Orwell by Matt Taibbi. Of course, though, Michael Schellenberger's reference is usually the born identity. He's going to give a ten-minute speech in a minute based on part two of John Wick. <laughs> so I think good faith, good humour, good grace, and a willingness to acknowledge that uh, we've all made mistakes. How are we going to get anywhere together? Well, what are you going to do? You're the one that's clearly going to try and become a politician any minute. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's obviously something that, like, is broken, you know, with us, with the internet. I mean, there's so, the treatment of each other on Twitter, we, we lose sight of the fact that, you know, we're all here for this very short period of time, and then we're gone. And we lose that we're losing that humanity. And I think we're also losing that sense in which, I mean, we don't want to be ruled by the police. You know, we don't want to be ruled by our military intelligence and security services. I mean, that's... They're, they're, and they don't, I think that most of the people in those agencies don't want to do it either. They don't want that responsibility. They want to, the best people want to be of service. And I guess the last thing I would just say is, I mean, this whole thing came because I was feeling really drawn to London right now. And it was, particularly earlier this year, there's so many people here who I admire. Francis, who, who gets up here, does this incredible podcast that's very, psychologically rich and very humanistic and I knew I wanted to come but I didn't have any reason to come 
until we figured out that there was the censorship industrial complex. And then when we put out the call to come and we see people that we know, uh, we see their faces. And so there's something that's been missing and then you feel like you, you're coming back to it when you're together. So I hope that, I thought that during the pandemic that there would be this moment when we would have sort of the pandemic as an over day, you know, where it'd be like, it's, you know, September, First, and the pandemic is over, and everyone burned their masks, you know, you know, in masks, and that never happened. And, and it feels like everybody wants to get back together, and they want to travel, and they want to be together. So, I hope this is the beginning of a series of international in-person gatherings of people that love freedom and that love community, because I think we really all—I know I need it, and I think that other people really need it too. Take on good faith 
that what's being censored is for your own good. That, you can't have that perspective anymore. We've been stripped of that. And I think I find that your sort of easy neutrality coupled with what appears to be virtue encouraging that it's uh, not governed by bombast and zeal and evangelism, which I rather like myself, uh, but kind of, well, no, these are the facts, here's the information. Is it, I, I'm enjoying the various ways that it's been sketched out. I do have a, uh, another question. Yes, there's a human female, I believe, over here in that area. Um, and there's a gentleman offering you the microphone where you can say your name if you want, unless you were also in Shawshank Redemption, in which case we'll work out. No, I don't know. Hi, I'm Hi. 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 This is fantastic. My name is Jeffrey Lewis. Um, I have a question for Michael, actually. Uh, I know you ran for governor in the Reduced Recall, I did book for you. And I was wondering how much um, you have experienced during that time of uh, whether this is. Um, you know, be it censorship industrial complex or any sort of forces of people being kept away from each other. I look at the two and we all seem to kind of come from different places, different little backgrounds. But one thing I've noticed in this country, where I've lived for 20 years, as well as when I go back to California, is kind of the old school liberals getting together with some of us on the center right, shall we say, and saying, okay, let's forget these pet issues because we're not going to have a country or countries unless we get the basics right. Obviously, free speech, free movement of money, um, civil liberties, all of that. How much did you um, experience when you were running for governor? And do you have any hope for California going forward, seeing as that, you know, the statement as goes to California, so goes the rest of the nation? The, the one thing that one benefit for running for political office is that you are supposed to have somewhat more protection of your speech. And so I'm not a fan of uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s position on vaccines or his position on nuclear power, but I admire him actually responding to the call and speaking out for freedom of speech, and I'm disturbed that he's having his videos taken down from YouTube. This is, a, a, I mean, a very significant uh, form of censorship, and I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by it. I'm very troubled by my adopted state of California. I mean, we had a woman on the streets, she was suffering from schizophrenia, uh, addicted to fentanyl and meth. They would not take her off the streets. The, the lower parts of her legs rotted. They took her to the hospital. They amputated her legs, and then they put her back on the streets. I don't understand how anybody can think of that as the humane, compassionate thing to do. We're letting ideology overtake just basic human response. And you know, those of us that have been in recovery or are in recovery and understand that all addiction requires a form of intervention. And so, yeah, for me, I, I think California requires an intervention. You know, we need to stand up and say, this is not, this is at some fundamental level not right. When you're, when you're, when you're not intervening in the lives of people who are destroying themselves in the downtown of your cities and you're destroying your cities. You know, businesses are now fleeing San Francisco, Westfield Mall. Nordstrom is leaving San Francisco, so I, I'm sorry I don't have a more positive uh, thing to say about it. I think that uh, no people, you know, when my book San Francisco came out in 2021, people were like, that's really rude, you know? <laughs> I can't believe you would say that. And now I think a new study came out today that shows that it's like of 170 cities in the country, San Francisco is considered like the worst managed. Not like you needed a survey to show it. So I'm afraid I don't have a lot of optimism about it. I think that reform may need to, it may need to be reversed and, and that reform may need to start in the East and sweep West rather than the other way around. It seems to me um, likely, possible, perhaps even necessary, that independent media will, by virtue of the role it will play in this issue among others, become politicized. In fact, it already is and will necessarily become activated and organized in ways that I think are becoming clear in the fact that you're perhaps expediating through your actions and through your foresight in uh, holding this event. I saw some hands. 
over there. The, I think I'm going to have to stay with the person who's nearest, because otherwise I'll have to sort of go, no, not you, you, for ages, and it'll, well, it'll do my head in. So you, mate, in the sort of denim looking shirt with sort of short white hair. Thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, quick question. With the absence of Barry White, is this an impression? Yes, it is. Good conference moment, Mr. Ruby, happy to hear that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was, I noticed a change in Bernie Sanders right after his wife was being investigated for her a college scandal. You guys, you guys remember that, right? Did, did you notice that happened about the same time? Yeah, I'm not sure it's related, but yeah. But it, it seemed that he tended to toe the line as soon as those charges were dropped, if you remember that. Yeah, um, so I, 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 I knew Bernie quite, quite well. I mean, I did a story on him. Um, one of the favorite stories of my whole life, I, I got to tag along with him in, when he was still in the house. Uh, he just let me follow him around. There was no off the record, nothing for like a month. Um, and his whole purpose was he wanted to show me how screwed up it was. Uh, and I always admired him. I admired his honesty. I think he's like really sincere about all these issues. My interpretation of what happened to Bernie, and I knew a lot of people who worked on this campaign. There, there was this crucial moment in 2016. When he was really scoring against Hillary Clinton, I don't know if you remember this, this was like January, February 2016, and the polls were going the wrong way for Hillary, and uh, he was really on a roll, and she was trying to come up with some kind of answer for, for anything that he was saying. Nothing was working until one day she came out and said, if we broke up the banks tomorrow, would that end racism? And Bernie just, at that moment, was paralyzed. He had no answer for that, and it was it was basically they, they had coded uh, caring about income inequality um, as a sort of privileged white issue. And you know, Bernie grew up in progressive circles. He was deeply sensitive to that kind of criticism. I just think he never got over that. I don't think he ever found the answer for that, and it it, it was difficult for him to respond. What, what about him getting Russiagated in the next election? I mean, he allowed himself to get Russiagated. Yeah, no, and, I've mentioned that. And, and he came. Is Bernie the same guy that he was before? Gentlemen, I asked all three of us. And it's an honest discussion. Do you think Bernie's the same guy? I'll let Michael uh, handle that. It's weird being in my position as the MC because I've got to say, take that mic off that geezer, and then I think, oh, it's a free speech event. <laughs> Michael, do you want to add anything? And then the person that's... Uh, oh, no, we do this uh, female human here. Oh, no, Stella Assange is in. Yes, we'll do Stella. Oh. I'll add this to the Bernie thing, because, it'll, because I don't know very much, so it'll be pretty succinct, I reckon. Um, I spoke to a few people that ran, you know, during those, that primary series, and they said to me that they felt that the Democrat Party would rather lose with Hillary than win with Bernie. They would rather have Trump in office than win with Bernie. So the internal market, so that still shows you where they stand ideologically and where their affiliations might be, given what Bernie represented during the period outlined by that gentleman. Mike, have you got anything to add? In which case, please, ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for Stella Assange? making me nervous again, because I speak all the time, but for some reason right now, probably because you guys are on stage, I'm really nervous to speak. Um, but anyway, as you... Would you feel more comfortable coming up here and jumping to... Yay! Yeah. Most of you are probably aware uh, that my husband, Julian, is on... He's in a very precarious position right now. But the High Court, England, has made the completely uh, inexplicable decision um, to not even allow him to appeal 
to the High Court. Uh, he made a, an application to appeal in September last year, and it took a single judge 10 months to issue a three-page decision, which, uh, without engaging in any of the arguments, said that Julian is not allowed to appeal. He still has one final opportunity to go to two different High Court judges. But the situation is now critical. And you might say, well, this is different to the censorship industrial complex, but it's not. These are two sides of the same coin. Whereas all of you have experienced uh, and seen the censorship that occurs on social media, this kind of unseen effect kind of turns you a bit paranoid, am I paranoid? Uh, is it really happening? Um, we now know, thanks to you guys, that uh, we have the evidence that it was happening, and it is happening, and how it's happening. But in Julian's case, this is the overt side of censorship. Uh, this is a publisher, someone who received information from a source, Chelsea Manning, who was a US soldier in Iraq, posted in Iraq, an intelligence analyst who witnessed, who was reading reports showing information about civilian killings, and there are tens of thousands of civilian killings in Iraq and Afghanistan, evidence of, a, of war crimes, including uh, a video that was released, uh, Collateral Murder, 2010, showing how a helicopter gunship uh, mowed down civilians, literally picking them off, including two journalists, and uh, critically injured two children, and mowed down the rescue vehicle who came to try to bring one of the dying journalists to a hospital and killed them all as well, except the two children survived because their father threw his body on top of them. They were severely injured, but they survived. Collateral murder. It's uh, age-restricted on YouTube because it might hurt your sensibility to witness a war crime. Well, Julian and WikiLeaks put that into the public domain and the record of tens of thousands of civilian killings in Iraq and Afghanistan and evidence of torture and evidence of how the US government was using its embassies to inhibit and derail uh, the investigations in Germany, in Spain, and Italy of CIA renditions to stop the people who were responsible for being brought to trial, for having their day in court, because it is an enforcement of impunity. And the case against Julian is of impunity against accountability. And the fact is that Julian is in prison because he published the truth, because he um, exposed the criminality of the country that is trying to extradite him. And that country also plotted to assassinate him when Pompeo was head of the CIA. How can this country, the UK, possibly extradite him to the United States? The country that plotted his assassination, the country that he exposed committing war crimes for whom no one has been held accountable. There has been a campaign of smearing uh, Julian for years in order to pave the way to his incarceration. Julian is a symbol. He's a deterrent. He's a, a message to every journalist to not publish the truth. To not publish the truth if it angers sufficiently powerful people, because they'll come after you. 
That is the message, but that's also the message to all of you. That's the, the general message that has been sent out, and we have to push back. We have to regain our rights. It's not something about going back to, you know, like hoping for a, a pre-COVID war or a pre-war on terror uh, existence. We have to fight back. We have to organize because the other side is organized and they're abusing uh, legislation. They're abusing the complacency of the public in order to get their way. Please follow Julian's case. Like, get engaged. It's critical now. We're at the end game. He could be extradited. He's facing 170 years, 175 years in the US under the Espionage Act. There's no public interest defense. He can't say why he published what he published. He can't say that it was war crimes, that the US government was responsible, etc. He has no defense. Defense, the last defense, is decent people around the world, here in the United States, defending the truth. On a Saturday, there's a concrete thing you can do, which is to come here at one o'clock. There's gonna be a statue here in Parliament Square, um, of Edward Snowden, uh, Chelsea Manning, and Julian, and there's an empty chair uh, next to them. They're standing on chairs, these statues, and there's an empty chair. It's called Anything to Say. You can stand up and say whatever you need to say. We all need to speak out. We need to use our speech, because our speech is the only thing that can shape the world we live in. The significance of, of Julian's case uh, for the future of journalism, um, it shows their total myopia and, and blindness, uh, and it, it's just, it's horrible. A couple other things though, Daniel Ellsberg just passed, um, and you know, we should, this is the uh, sort of analogous figure uh, from the 70s, once much celebrated by quote unquote the sort of liberal America. In fact, they very recently made a hagiographic movie, The, the Post, uh, celebrating the heroism of the Washington Post uh, and bringing the, the Pentagon Papers out and defying the government that would censor it. Um, that's sort of the cover story. The reality is something we found in the Twitter files. There was a, uh, an episode that we discovered where uh, a number of journalists got together. This was connected to the, the tabletop exercise that Michael talked about. Um, Stanford University academics, members of uh, the U.S. government, uh, for a year preceding that exercise, planned uh, what they could to, to overturn what they called the Pentagon Papers principle. They wanted to change this idea that journalism was about bringing dangerous truths to the public. They believed that they wanted to reverse that whole concept, that journalism was actually about protecting the public from things that it didn't need to know. Um, and so we see this dramatic shift in values where even the Washington Post, which again was taking credit for the Pentagon Papers as it was doing this. Um, so they're, they're about to try to send Julian Assange to, to jail for 170 years. Is that how much it is? 175? And, and at the same time, they, they want to turn journalism into this thing that is about keeping people from knowing what the truth is. And that's, it's, it's completely backwards and, and I can't be condemned enough. Just that I'm totally moved by the case and I have a lot more learning to do <laughs> and I look forward to getting educated speaking out on it. I will then add that um, Stella, I'm very grateful to you for uh, bringing the spirit <coughs> to our conversation and it's 
He's very fortunate to have you as an advocate and an ally, and it, we are fortunate to be reminded that this is not a hypothetical conversation about a foreboding and potential problem. It is a tide that has already risen and claimed some territory has already been yielded and ceded, and it is, um, I'm very grateful to you for explaining that so articulately with such evident and obvious emotion as a uh, campaigner and as a lawyer, but also as a wife and as a mother. Thank you very much for bringing that. We'll take a final question. I suppose that we'll take it from uh, this person over here who is... Oh no, let's take someone from... Oh no, that'll kill the microphone guy. You're going to have to shout. I guess what I would say is when we were shown the visibility filtering tools that Twitter had, we were almost exclusively shown the negative stuff. So we took pictures of uh, screenshots where you would see notations like trends blacklist or search blacklist. And this was all about reducing the visibility of a person who had accumulated some kind of demerit. And that was useful because before the Twitter files, remember Twitter was publicly maintaining um, that they didn't shadow ban. Uh, you know, they actually put out a, a, a piece called, uh, the, I think it was like the inside story on shadow banning or something like that, right? And the, the, the short version, we don't do it. Um, but they do do it. They have, and the, we know they have an extraordinary array of tools that they can use to dial down um, visibility. On the other side, they, we didn't learn as much. And we've heard hypothetically, uh, from, I mean, not hypothetically, we've heard sort of, uh, you, you know, through stories from people like uh, the author Abigail Schreier uh, talking about how she was told that, you know, another author uh, could be magnified on a site like Amazon, for instance, uh, so that everybody would see the ad for that that author, while you know her book would be seen by nobody, uh, we didn't see concrete evidence of that at, at Twitter. But I'm assuming they can do that. Is that is that something? Okay, oh, we, we could probably do one more. Maybe if we could get a, uh, someone from Britain. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I love Americans. Don't get me wrong. Well, you are censoring. We kind of speak over right. a little bit. Prove your Britishness by being awkward, bashful, asking a long, tangential, and confusing question. Yes, you sir. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he was plainly stood up, that geezer. You can, you, you, we'll, get a, we'll get a mic for you. Hold on a they are English because they're fucking awkward. I tell you. <laughs> But I'm not alone. We've seen the beacon of truth is illustrated by Julian Assange as a permanent reminder of the heights that we may not reach to. But now we even have a bar with these technological platforms that we know we cannot cross, that we dance and we walk the line. Or we go to a decentralized platform, Odyssey Rumble, which offers us the opportunity to speak our truth, but to a smaller audience who perhaps are where we're preaching to the converted and the choir already. So how then do we tackle the likes of Facebook and YouTube and these other mainstream platforms without 
another money bags who's free spirit to come and buy up all these channels? How do we fight back? Because there are thousands of broadcasters around the world right now who are unable to speak the truth because the line has been set and we can only dance around it or go to another platform where we can't reach the masses who need to get this information. personal requirement 
challenge where I have to observe my own tendency to want to control, my own tendency to be competitive or petty or trivial. I recognise I have a personal responsibility that I see other people tackling far more gracefully even on this stage, an ability to be open-minded, an ability to be intrepid and investigative. And the contribution from Stella reminds us of the necessity for sacrifice. The thing that I have continual recourse to that inspires me continually, actually, is that I marvel at the endeavour involved in creating these systems of control. The shutting down of protest, the endless surveillance, the censorship, the legal tools that are, de de are deployed, the technological tools that are deployed, the willingness to overrule democracy, national sovereignty, to smear even the most truthful uh, endeavours as being somehow mendacious or duplicitous. It also reminds me that there is a necessity to overtly, obviously and plainly refute the claims that are often made, to be clear about inclusivity, to be absolutely open-hearted and loving towards people of all forms of identification, all forms of religious, cultural, national identification, have to be openly embraced. There has to be, as we saw there, when people favour, when one man at least, favoured another person's free speech above their own. When we have recourse to simple, I call Sesame Street values, kindness, service, sweetness to one another, I feel then that we have a great power, a great power, that they wouldn't be working nearly so hard if they did not fear us. And while we have in the figure of Julian Assange a potential martyr, we don't have to allow that to be the case. We have to bond and bind and be vocal together and willing to sacrifice and willing to support the great work and bravery of journalists where we find them and be forgiving of other people who don't have those values. It's difficult to be outspoken. It's difficult to be brave. Sure as hell, it must be difficult to endure life without trust trial in Belmarsh or the potential of 175 years without trial in a country he may yet be exiled to. We must learn to recognise heroism when we see it. We must be willing to forgive fallibility in ourselves and others. We must recognise that we have a deep and powerful resource within us and it is available to all of us in this instant now. Thank you very much.